will continue, and uh, I'll, I'm actually coming to the, the one of the key points of uh, validation uh, through this terminology comparison. So, really, what is the difference between idea and innovation? And uh, and here the 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 main challenge that most uh, most people who are not familiar with the terminology in the startup world and, and related to building new new products and services easily mix these two things as the same, specifically when we add the invention part. So an invention uh, and innovation, they are so similar and at the same time so different in reality. And, and I, I've been very surprised that even the most uh, experienced serial entrepreneurs or coaches or trainers uh, in very high reputation uh, institutions and very known name still kind of miss the key point uh, on how, how to separate this. Um, and again, this is not this is not my opinion. This is not my own uh, this observation. This is just when you really find go really deep into these uh, terminologies that. Um, this is how they have been defined, and I think uh, I haven't checked, but I think even Wikipedia may still have it a bit unclear uh, on the innovation. So here, the the really key point is the validation part. So an idea or invention is not validated, and the validation really means. Um, that it's not just something new, it's just not something theoretical, but it actually is proven um, to not be validated. So idea and invention, they are just those. So invention is, you know, you have seen probably like some comics and humoristic things about these crazy gadgets that just, they are just crazy, but they, they for inventor, maybe they make sense, but for others, they may not. Um, and it's a totally separate process then to get to innovation. And, and there wouldn't be need for word innovation if idea and invention uh, would be same. Then those word, words could be used on to relate replace innovation. So there's a reason why word innovation exists. And the logical difference is the validation. So basically, the innovation means that it's proven and it creates new value. So it, it can be, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a product. It can be a product, it can be a method, a business model, a process. Um, so it doesn't define uh, the, the kind of the element in question. It just defines what it what it is, what it does. So it creates new value compared to other solutions, previous other solutions. And the proven part. So this is specifically the, what the validation means. Is that it is somehow measurable. So it's known and validated. So, if we say there is new value, we have to be we have to be able to show what the new value is. If we can't show what the value is, then it's not validated because the only way to validate something is to prove it. So, what new value? The other part of that validation, specifically in the context of business, is to whom? So, who is the customer? So, who experiences the value? So if we can't identify who, it is also very hard to measure the actual value because those that are the who actually defined um, the value. They basically say, yes, there is value to us in whichever way. So they may pay for it, they may just use it uh, indirectly, and the, the business model can be an uh, indirect business model like Facebook, those users uh, experience the value of the service, while advertisers see the value 
uh, from the different perspective. But there, there is value even in a free product if the, if the users are very engaged and they use it. But they need to be known who they are. And then the how. So the how part is key when, it's, when it comes to developing a business. So if we know what value to whom, and this is the uh, market fit, actually, the, the term we can use here, uh, but how is that deliver is the essence of where we can build a company around. And we can consider how can we scale that how. So in an essence, the innovation term in a startup is all about this um, validation and then the how. So if we now compare just an idea or uh, the invention, it misses all of these ingredients. Or they are stated in a theoretical form, so it's not proven. So there is no person to say that this value it generates me in this way, or it is very limited. Uh, the reason why these terms can get very confusing is also that uh, there are variations of the same word, like innovative. So basically, the innovative is something in between that is, is casually used, and, and again, it sounds like innovation, but it's different word. So innovative basically means that it is in process, in progress uh, from becoming an invention to innovation. So you need a word to describe that as well. So innovative is that it has that potential but it's not proven. So someone who says, sees an in invention, they could say, yeah, that can be innovative. That's pretty innovative. Instead of saying, yeah, that's an invention. So this is the, the terminology part. And when we talk about uh, innovation, um, this, um, it's important to understand this kind of uh, uh, how these can be considered. So there are types of innovation, like technology, uh, usually in the form of product or service. There's a business model, like Uber is a clear business model. Innovation, process, uh, process can be a much more efficient way of producing something. Uh, position that can be that there is a, a model that now works in auto industry and then we are uh, considering that in some other industry and so forth and the categories here are iterative so basically that means uh, improving the product version after version so that's more kind of slow evolutionary path of innovation. This is more traditional for uh, bigger companies and existing products. Then lateral. Lateral is specifically when taking that innovation or a concept from one context to another. So for example, when Uber was very early stage uh, in the startup world, there was the concept of what is Uber for X? So basically to help describe like how this Uber, Uber business model innovation could be applied to different industries or Airbnb for, for parking and things like that. So that's a lateral innovation category. And then disruptive is something where usually it means that um, uh, a totally new approach is common that is not lateral, it's not iterative, it's not coming from elsewhere. Usually it is uh, it's a concept where you take an existing old, uh, very big uh, market or service, like let's say banking, and you break it to all of the different pieces and you consider what is the essence of banking, what is the core value to whom and how it's delivered, and then you basically just restructure that 
with a totally new approach, uh, utilizing the latest technologies and platforms and behavior patterns and so forth to create a totally disruptive approach. It doesn't yet mean that it's validated, but it is a new disruptive potential innovation. And the key of most startups is that it actually is a combination of, of these uh, uh, variable things. It can be a combination of few elements, it can be a combination of multiple elements, and it can in, in, in include iterative uh, innovation in certain parts, and it can be disruptive on the other parts. For example, in case of Uber, the technology was actually iterative, uh, while the business model was disruptive. So it's a combination usually of, of multiple things and at the same time. So you can pretty much um, have this in different, different ways. And when we evaluate the business potential, uh, we should have some basic uh, measures or kind of um, as I was uh, studying uh, or co-founding the Grow BC group basically it took me almost four years to find the right type of uh, business potential I went through hundreds and hundreds of business ideas um, before I felt that uh, the right one was there for me to commit um, and this is different having like uh, done enough startups that you don't want to just jump to the next one. So I had put uh, personally quite uh, big criteria. So part of these filters are kind of also from, from that time. So you want to check your idea and innovation potential, um, whether there is a small market or a big market whether the market is shrinking or market is growing. So one could say that, that actually the market for smartphones is already starting to shrink. So it's not yet shrinking perhaps, uh, but it's starting to get there. If we would take the analogy even further, like fax machines, at some point it was clear that the, the market was totally disappearing. So you want to kind of consider how your innovation is aligned with the market growth. Um, also from the timing factor, which is a, a challenging topic and the most difficult even for most experienced entrepreneurs to figure, uh, is whether the market is in a push format or in a pull format. So whether the market already identifies the value well, whether they identify and is responsive for the innovation or you have to be educating the market. So, for example, uh, ProVC was one of the companies, actually the first one to ever bring equity crowdfunding to the markets. Uh, and this was 2009 when we started. So we had to do a lot of market push. So at the same time, there's a great opportunity to be in the first to the market but at the same time, you are stuck with this um, educating the market uh, scenario. So the market timing between market push and market pull is, is a very key factor to identify. And of course, then the how scalable you can make uh, the delivery of the value. So the how of the innovation how scalable that can be made. And many could argue that, well, you can't really make that scalable or you can't make this scalable. And that may be true until it's done. So there's very few things that can't be scaled, but it's not necessarily always obvious how that can be done or whether be able to be successful in it. But I think that nobody could argue that you can, that, that you wouldn't be able to scale a coffee shop. I think startup has proven us very clearly that uh, a, a, a coffee shop can in fact be scaled pretty effectively. So even consulting can be scaled. There are many models where consulting companies operate under one brand as independent companies and so forth. So there's a kind of 
franchise model even behind those. But the consideration is that if you're looking to grow, you have to find a scalable model, but you don't have to start with scalable model. You can start with very manual approach to learn and then find the scalability or develop the scalability throughout the validation. So <clears throat> about the entrepreneur and startup. And the key difference is that entrepreneur, when we talk about entrepreneurs, they are individual. And here, I think the most obvious thing that you see uh, is the relationship between startups and media. Uh, for some reason, a lot of media like to highlight the individual, the entrepreneur. Whether, and, and I would say the most kind of love it and hate it uh, model uh, person uh, these days is Mark Zuckerberg as, as the founder of Facebook. And uh, at the same time, um, entrepreneurs as it's not an individual sport. So it's, it's, it's really a team sport. So startup is an entrepreneurial team of co-founders with equity stakes. So while there are uh, rare cases and, and even uh, some of the most successful cases are very strongly um, idolized as about one individual, being that Steve Jobs, being that Mark Zuckerberg, being that uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, or pick any of the, the kind of the most known entrepreneur in any local country, it comes down to individual. But that's a lot of, of that is untrue. It's, it's uh, what is shown and what media likes to talk about, about the individual. And it also comes down to how the co-founding team members have agreed that usually they are happy that just one individual takes the spotlight and takes all the kind of uh, media coverage work and, and that kind of role to their shoulders. But you should not mix that with what happens inside the company and what is needed for the company to actually build. And this comes very clear when you discuss with those um, that you look for resources, whether that's support, whether that's advisory, whether that's mentoring, whether that's a business loan, whether that's an investor. They all look for teams. They don't look for individuals because individuals are very high risk in many different ways because carrying the load of the development as an individual is very stressful, it's very in, uh, consuming and uh, also when things don't go right and there's a lot of pressure and even if we take all of those away anything can happen to an individual quite easily. It can be run by a bus, then what happens to the whole company and all of the investments there? So this is a, it's, it's a, it's a definitely a risk perspective and risk management perspective. While on the other side, it's also the resource perspective of having all the resources at the core team to be able to develop the company. So, as an entrepreneurship, uh, the kind of the mindset, there's many uh, descriptions for entrepreneurs uh, and entrepreneurship, and this is one of my favorites that I have found online. The, the, the real author behind this is, is not clear, uh, and that's why I haven't put it there, because it was stated in, a, in, a, in an article that, that uh, it has come from somewhere where they don't also know that. The, the person behind who made this statement. But for me, it's one of the best descriptions where as an entrepreneur, you're always lacking resources. You're always having less than what you need to do the next phase. So in the beginning, you don't have nothing or you have your own resources that you have accumulated. You go for further and you want to grow, you are still lacking team members, you're still lacking money, you're still lacking channels, you're still lacking customers. So basically, it's a pursuit of that opportunity, regardless of what resources you currently have. Basically, it means that you trust 
that you are able to get those resources, whether that's knowledge, whether that's money, whether that's support, whether that's access along the way. So you just trust that ability to secure those resources in the future at the same time as you're pursuing the opportunity. So why startups? And there's many reasons for, for this. And, and uh, if, if I look at the, the perspective of how the government see and how the, 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 you know, the public side sees is about job creators and uh, those who create new economic value, uh, growth of GDP, uh, bring new innovations, help improve and solve problems. Those are all important things from the larger societal perspective. But if we look at the more practical means from the perspective of, of uh, uh, tool or structure, they really are the optimal, optimal vehicles for creating innovations. Because they are only built around the innovation potential, the innovative process to try to build something new. That's pretty much the reasons of why startups are created. For innovation, the word startup actually comes from much further history, more than, I don't know, 40, 50 years back, or even, even longer, that was created by venture capital industry to have a term for the specific type of companies they were looking. And usually they were also referred as technology startups, whereas the term technology uh, is less present these days because it's not only about technology innovation, uh, but other, 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 other forms of innovation as well. So startups really encapsulate all the relevant things and none of the unnecessary things in the structure. It really tries and has to work in this pursuit of opportunity, regardless of resources control, has uh, effective use of whatever resources are available. Also, the drive and motivation, because creating something new already has a, a barrier to entry. So to, to cross those, there has to be this initial drive and motivation then usually only get stronger as the progress start and more people join. Uh, but of course, through obstacles and, and uh, not finding the, the validation and so forth, the drive and motivation can also disappear. Uh, they are also the most investable uh, vehicles. So basically you can invest into those and they are made more and more openly investable by anyone. So if, if you would try to invest in an innovation that is built by a big company, you can only, if it's a public company, yes, you can buy their stock uh, from the stock market, but you are not specifically investing into any of their individual product or innovation, but the company as a whole. And those opportunities come available only if they are public. So in a private company and specifically in startups, it's the innovation, pot potential innovation encapsulated that you can invest along the way at different uh, phases. And they provide the most authentic validation. So if you come up with a new innovation or potential innovation and you would validate that as a big company, it already comes with the existing customer base, with existing brand recognition, with ex existing budgets and marketing, you know, expertise and all the different things, the previous experience of previous products and so forth. So a new product or new innovation by existing company has a lot of bias built in where the authentication for validating whether the new innovation is exists or not actually becomes much harder. Whereas a new company, you start with nothing, it's an unknown name, it's an unknown brand, it's an unknown everything. So all of the validations are very specific to whether actually the, the, the customers see the value. 
in what's been offered. And also, there's a big uh, this trickle down effect from startups. So uh, even with the failed cases, there's enormous amount of learnings and that people taking part in startups get uh, where it's almost impossible to acquire anywhere else because there's such a holistic and complete responsibility of many things and you have to learn many things much faster um, and much more practical level than in any other types of um, structures, whether that's education institutions or whether that's big companies where you always have so many others things to, that impact um, the ability to see the, the progress or measure your own contribution. So startups are agile, you start small, you validate and you scale. And there are several uh, company examples when someone starts to immediately try starting big. There was one uh, famous case in Finland called uh, Rugo, I think it was the company name where the famous experienced business people and some of the entrepreneurs came together as investors and they put something like 10 million, 20 million and then additional public funding to try to create a big company from the scratch. Basically they looked to hire something like 150 people when, before they had even validated the business model. And it's pretty clear that uh, it is very difficult to get that type of model to work because how do you create the processes of the company? What do you actually do when none of the things that you are planning to do actually have proven to work? So regardless, even if it's a big company or with big resources doing something, it is more effective to start small, validate and scale. And startups are all about this. Then it's a rel relative question, what is small uh, to start with? Because that depends on industry, that depends on the, you know, if you would like to start a new energy company, then I would say the small would still look pretty big. But, um, but the main point is that you don't start too big and just assume it will work just because you create it. So startups are all about an, an entrepreneurship as an essence in part of that team. It's about turning negatives into positives. So of course, where others see problems, we see opportunities. So a problem is an opportunity to create a new solution that is better, creates new value, and as such, problems are great things. And actually, it's not only about the main product and the main problem. In startup, you're solving problems all the time. How do we get to 100 customers? How do we get to 1,000 customers? How do we do this cheaper? How do we do this faster? How do we get access to that person? How do we get funding? All of these are problems at different scale. Or if something breaks, how do we fix it? How do we regain uh, confidence? How do we regain uh, our customers' trust? And so forth. It's a constant flow of solving bigger and smaller problems. Where others see limited resources, entrepreneurs see a source of resource, resourcefulness. So basically this means, for example, if there's a big, you know, event, industry event that you would go to want to present your new products or new services, uh, where if you would have a lot of money already, if you would have a lot of resources, you would probably just buy a stand and then depending on your budget, you would buy it at the better location or on the sidelines and so forth, but that's using resources to get access. Being resourcefulness means basically that you will try to get yourself in the States to talk to the whole audience about your product and service. But to get there, you have to come up with a, a clever way. The same is advertising on the, on the, on the website or a, 
a magazine. So the other one costs money and you get limited exposure. You buy an ad. The other one is if you can get a story made out of your company or your product or the problem and associate your company and product to that problem that the article is discussing about, now you get authentic visibility just because you didn't have resources. So these are the things that actually you can get much more impact with much less resources because you are forced to do so. But if you have resources, most likely you never learn to be uh, more uh, resourcefulness. A big part of building ventures is about taking risk, a calculated risk, a measurable risk, uh, uh, knowingly taking risk, and as a return you get the rewards. So, for example, um, if you work in a public sector and you would have to improve a, a process or you would like to introduce a new service, if you fail in there, you actually can have the, the very big downside. Usually you would get most of the, resp the, the responsibility and all the blame why you did this and it, it failed. But the, ups the upside also is that even if you create you know, something really good, the best thing that you can get is perhaps you, know, you get some, some extra one year's one month salary or you get you know a price you get a new desk lamp <laughs> or a new chair so in startups this is quite the opposite you have all the responsibilities all the risk you have all the all the rewards as well of course this is divided with team members and investors so anyone who takes risk at any level uh, that's how it, it's balanced challenges so challenges like problems, we see those as passions. So when you're challenged on something that you can't do that or you, you, that is crazy, usually that just makes us more passionate about not to argue, but to try to prove it wrong. And, and this is the, the opportunity and with challenges. Lack of structure, so when there are no processes, there is no security nets, uh, there is no perhaps even offices in the beginning and so forth, at the same time this gives us freedom. Without office we can combine our customer development and product development in a coffee shop that is commonly done. Uh, we can do many things, uh, we can decide our working hours, um, and, and so forth. So with lack of structure, we get the freedom. If we think we're small, we're not convincing, we are not uh, um, big enough to play at a certain level, well, on the other side is the agility. We can be agile, we can be much faster, we can learn much faster, we can consume knowledge much faster, we can put things in practice much faster, we can put a product concept in the morning and we can put it out by the evening to test whether it works. None of this is possible with bigger structures for, for the reasons that are quite obvious. Uh, we discussed about this when it's unknown brand, unknown company, uh, it's more authentic validation. So it's harder to do authentic validation with the known brand. So these are the opportunities and, and why startups uh, exist, why do these stru stru structures make sense? When there's limited knowledge, basically it means that this, when you start with limited knowledge, you automatically understand that you have to consume knowledge, you have to learn new things, you have to learn those all the time. So it actually creates a pattern where you start with learning and you continue with learning. You never feel ready because you are always trying to push harder, you are trying to come up to the next level, you are trying to create the next thing. And if you don't know how to do X, Y, and Z, you learn. So you are in a constant learning mode to learn how to solve problems, 
And that's a very big strength that many are missing. Because they just have a certain learning and in many ways they just always apply the same old learning even if the world around has changed. And key here is that some of the learning is um, validated through many decades that it still is uh, functional and some of the learnings, specifically when it comes to certain technologies or technology solutions or, or, or new things that new innovations has enabled, there are many things that can be done the different ways while you are still solving the same problem and you are applying same uh, solving principles to that, but you are using different techniques and you are using different technologies to solve that problem. Um, when we think about big companies, we think that they have a lot of resources. Um, if we think some of the rich countries, like some of the Arabic countries or Norway, they have a lot of resources. But actually, those resources are not, are not that easily available, specifically in the big company. The resources are not easily available. There's a lot of limitations how you can get resources inside a company and at the same time you are limited to resources that are only available in that structure. Whereas in a startup you are not limited by any structural limitations. You can seek for resources from anywhere, geographically, uh, from different business verticals, through different companies, investors, people, investors and so forth. So you really have much more sources for resources uh, than you have uh, when you are inside a bigger organization. And I want to mention those uh, that are money-rich countries. Uh, why is there so little innovation coming out of those countries? Why is so little startups coming out? Why isn't Google able to come up with the working social media platform with all of the money, with all of the great resources they have. It doesn't mean that if you have the resources, you can automatically create something. And these are the reasons for why these factors matter. It's not only about one thing, it's about the whole um, structural things and what these that can be considered challenges actually enable uh, startups to be doing things differently. So unprotected means that you are you pretty much are forced to be very open. You have to talk about a lot of your business, how you're doing things, uh, to be able to attract people, to be able to attract um, um, investors, uh, team members, partners, and so forth. So a big part of this being unprotected is you become automatically very open. And openness specifically as how the world is, is these days, openness usually leads more into more opportunities that leads into more business partnerships and so forth. Being very protected uh, usually means being also much more closed, much more restricted, and, uh, and this is the, 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 the other side of the coin. Same goes with the lack of security. When you know that if you fail, the consequences are bigger than let's say you fail at, uh, uh, you lose a job. Um, so this also usually means that startups are attracted by the, uh, those type of people are attracted to startups that want to challenge themselves, that want to get more out of themselves, that want to have drive and want to learn and grow as individuals. So usually it means that, uh, that um, this is also a contributing factor, a combining factor of the success of the startups. <clears throat> There are those people and uh, that you can also come across quite often who would actually like to get all the excitement and 
and fun part of being in a startup with freedom and flexibility, but at the same time they're looking for security. They would like to get paid, they would like to get salary from day one, they would like to get all kinds of uh, security in place. And uh, the earlier the, the startup is in their journey, you can understand the more impossible equation that is. Because it starts from people. And if people are uh, seeking for security, then they are not the right people to start uh, companies as co-founders. It becomes very hard because the challenges only begin from there. Um, <clears throat> this goes for the um, need of funding. So it's like any other resources, when you don't have enough, then you become much smarter on how you use that funding. If you have a lot of funding, you start using that funding um, much more easier. And the re there's a right or there's a right and wrong time for funding. And specifically, this is also why investors are more interested in investing in later states than early states, is where if you start with money heavy in the beginning, then actually you remove all the abilities to learn and, and create these patterns and structures into the company uh, to be more efficient in the, in the use of, of money. So when you already are very clever and innovative in solving problems and finding ways to get you know, into magazine or uh, into states of an industry event, then to apply funding to that makes, makes the whole thing fly much further than if just trying to do things with money. So usually this is related to once the validation is done and the, the, the company has a good initial position and it's um, gaining market share, that's where a lot of money also makes sense to try to send the signal to the markets that we want to own this market segment. We want to have a bigger market share and we have plenty of money to fight anyone who comes across. But sometimes even that doesn't work. There's a reason why Facebook had to buy Instagram, Instagram why they had to buy WhatsApp. It's because regardless of what they tried to do to fight with money and skills and ability, the market had spoken that they prefer these products. And they were gaining market share regardless of Facebook Messenger or Facebook image sharing and so forth. And uh, there was a high price that was paid, but now Facebook owns those. And naturally, there is no bosses or others to blame. So why things succeed or why things fail? Usually the person is in the same room or it's in the mirror, and that is a big part of why startups. There is no long political you know, discussion like in the case of Brexit, who's to blame of the situation we are now and whose responsibility is to fix it. And, and that's like the ultimate level of, of, of situation that just takes a lot of time and the uncertainty just basically makes things, keeps making things worse for everyone. So, no boss, no others to blame, so not such a protection saying it, it wasn't me, it was someone else, makes you take responsibility and that also changes the behavior of how you do things going forward. So, I'll stop here just to check if there's any questions at this point. Okay, so we'll, we'll continue to cover a little bit of the perspective in um, the terminology from the uh, between startup, a scale up, and a small business. So, in many countries, the term startup is basically understood to be any new company uh, 
And uh, of course, there is no such thing as wrong definition if the defi if, uh, officially approved definition doesn't exist. But for the for the sake of uh, uh, generalized um, globally neutral view, this is how to to look at the difference between a small business, a startup, and a scale up in a in a way that makes logical sense. So a small business basically is operating in a market with validated business model. So being that the barber shop, being that the coffee shop, being that the consulting business and so forth. But for some reason there is a low growth ambition or they don't want to or they have not considered the case scalable business model to expand that business forward. And therefore the term small business. It basically means that it's not growing. It, whatever size it is, if it's small enough to be called small business, it's, uh, it's small and not growing. Usually because there's no growth ambition and or there is no scalable business model, which can be figured if there's ambition to do so. A startup, the difference between a startup and a scale-up is that the startup is a new company with high growth ambition um, with a scalable model or will be creating a scalable model in the future, but they are working with unvalidated business model. So basically they have not validated that yet, and that's why it's a startup. And a scale-up is someone who has the ambition to grow, has a scalable business model, um, and is already operating with market-validated business model. Now, these are not, you know, on off type of things, these are iterative things. So a startup moves gradually to become a scale-up, or it can also move gradually to become just a small business if it loses its ambition or doesn't find a scalable business model. A small business can also become a scalable, a scale-up if it wants to, if it finds a growth ambition, let's say a family business Sometimes when the next generation takes over, sometimes they suddenly find this growth ambition and they start to become a scale up. Just to scaling their existing business model uh, with ambition and a scalable business model. So these are not necessarily that all the scale ups only comes from startups, they can also come from elsewhere. So a startup is an entrepreneurial team with innovative idea, not yet innovation, designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model with target to grow fast in a big and or fast growing market. So this has been now put in the context of highlighting the importance of the team, where it starts from, with what type of um, idea, an innovative one, uh, designed to search for repeatable and scalable business model with the target to grow fast and should be aiming for big or fast growing market. So this was our kind of structural definition that we have put together. This uh, Steve Langs, who is the, one of the most known entrepreneurs and educators from from Stanford University and he has done his own companies and ex exits and has created a lot of resources um, from, America, from an American uh, startup creation uh, model that doesn't necessarily apply in all of the countries because uh, different uh, markets and different uh, opportunities. But his focus is clearly, is a temporary business or partnership or organization. So it doesn't even say it has to be a company. It's a structure, a project, partnership, designed to search for repeatable and scalable business model. So here he also refers to search for repeatable business model. So it, it's not a scale up in this sense because it's still in the search of repeatable and scalable business model. Designed to grow fast, in a big and fast growing market. So you can see we have taken elements from his uh, statement, but we have highlighted the team 
and the beginning part of innovative idea. Uh, this is Paul Graham, uh, the pre-founder and creator of Y Combinator. I would say the first real accelerator in the world and, uh, and the creator of that whole concept, a serial entrepreneur. And uh, he has also a lot of valuable resources and knowledge available, and also a bit different perspective. Um, but highlighting that just being newly founded doesn't itself make a company a startup. The essential thing is the growth. So the growth is a key factor, but also it's not necessarily about technology or about taking venture funding. So it's not about funding rounds necessarily, it's all about the growth. And it's also not about having to have an exit. So that's a key thing here of his statement. So there's a lot of bias in the startup world about investors and funding and exits, but the key things, funding and exit are investors built in mandatory things that they have to consider. So it's natural that it comes whenever in context of investors and their motivations. But it's not aligned fully with building startups and from the entrepreneurs and co-founders perspective. The beautiful thing is when you get this aligned, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they should be always seek to be aligned. Because you have to remember that in it's built into the investor's business model, basically, depending on whether it's business angels or VCs. In VC level, usually it's built in that only one, of, one out of 10 needs to succeed. Everything is built out of that model. They would like every single case they invest to succeed, but basically they are betting with the portfolio approach. So basically they are giving 10% of success that those one out of 10 will bring all the profits to also cover all the losses and investments on those nine. Usually there are some mediocre success in between, depending on the fund and so forth. But basically as an entrepreneur, you understand that the odds against you are very high. You basically have 10% of success rate at the time when you are in the investor's portfolio. Many fail to consider this uh, structural statistical perspective because it's not only that you could say that, well, it doesn't really change how we operate and how we work, but in fact it does because the investor wants to push the venture in a way and at the risk level that has that kind of exit opportunity. So you may not want to fail and take such risks because as a founder with a failed venture, you the least have to go and start all over again. So at least if nothing else, you lose time if you didn't lose money. So that's the perspective, but when these things do get aligned, when there's such a growth opportunity and the company is already growing, and you have such a strong negotiation position to choose the investors who can join that growth, usually then the terms gets also much better and, uh, and the likelihood of success also gets better. And of course, there are many types of investors with uh, many types of profiles. So here's uh, more of a personal flavor, and this is something that I keep iterating and also, uh, one more to try to capture uh, a definition for startup. It's an innovation in an identifiable, so have a website, a logo, a brand, and an investable form. So it's open to take resources, money, finance from outside, but not necessarily at any cost. That is in process to validate and capture the value of innovation. So this means the value of the company grows by capturing the value of that innovation into the company with target of scalable growth for positive impact. So target of scalable growth is 
means that it doesn't necessarily have to start with scalable business model, but that's the target. So starting with these and getting them aligned and, and getting to the scale and becoming a scaler. And for positive impact, I would say that uh, for the majority of the entrepreneurs uh, building companies with passion are actually trying to solve a real problem and really have, wanting to have a significant impact in a positive sense into the world because that usually is a much bigger and more better driver for success than just doing it for the money. Startup is not the optimal vehicle to become rich. There are much more easier ways to become rich. Usually they just involve a lot of boring steps. So doing the education, getting a good job, doing hard work, and, uh, and basically grinding your way through an organization uh, is, is much more secure way to become rich in most countries than being an entrepreneur, specifically when trying to do an innovation at the same time. So uh, evaluating this other dimension of the, of the building the organization side, not only the innovation, should be looked in from um, from a team validation perspective that um, to get some idea of the kind of these key elements. So with less potential on the left side, more potential on the right side. So a solo entrepreneur versus a good team uh, is a very clear uneven skills, balanced skills. So this means that not everyone should be an accountant, not everyone should be a business guy, not everyone should be a developer, but actually having a balanced skill set, a designer, a developer, and a business guy, to simplify that, or go even better. Um, not committed, committed. So this is pretty on and off thing as well, and I'll get to that in the startup development phases, but there has to be a validation whether the commitment is there or not there. And, um, and that's a very strong uh, piece to communicate also about um, your team towards uh, investors or additional team members or, or even customers. Uh, a talker attitude, a doer attitude. So this can be simplified as the attitude, but you know the type uh, that usually sees problems where others see challenges. Uh, saying that, you know, I don't know how to do it, or that's someone else's job, uh, that's not a good fit. That type of attitude, or people with that type of attitude in a startup. What you need is a learner, a doer attitude. So if you don't know how to do it, then you'll you do it to learn, or you learn to do it, but you'll get it done. So this is the type of attitude and the, the types of people with the type of attitude you should uh, build your team with. Wrong culture, right culture. So basically a culture is a, is a thing that exists in all of the organization, it exists in all the structures, in all the countries, in sport teams, families, and so forth. So you want to design the culture and make it clear what your company is about, what your startup is about, and, and protect that culture with your behavior and with your agreements and with your rule of conduct and so forth. If you don't have a clear culture, it becomes much harder to, to um, attract right type of people uh, into the organization. 